small for gestational age. So as we know, all babies come in different shapes and sizes, just like all adults come in different shapes and sizes. In this video, we're going to be focusing on the small babies and what we need to look out for. So starting off with some definitions. So how do we define an SGA baby? So we define it as an estimated fetal weight or abdominal circumference less than the 10th centile. And we define severe SGA as an AFW or AC less than the third centile. So what does all of this mean? So first of all, these acronyms refer to ultrasound measurements. So we've got the abdominal circumference and the estimated fetal weight obtained from an ultrasound. These are then automatically plotted on a centile chart, which compares that measurement to a similar population at the same gestational age. This line at the bottom of the chart denotes the 10th percentile. Therefore, all babies lying below this line are defined as SGA babies. Now let's have a look at some causes. So as we said before, babies come in all shapes and sizes. Of course, we're not expecting a short petite couple to have the same size of baby as two six-footers. We are expecting them to have a smaller baby, which is normal for them. So in fact, we know that 50 to 70% of SGA babies are constitutionally small. Next, we've got pathological causes, and these are divided into two. The non-placenta-mediated growth restriction and placenta-mediated growth restriction. So starting with the non-placenta-mediated growth restriction, we've got a structural anomaly, chromosomal anomaly, fetal infection, and inborn errors of metabolism, which could all contribute to a smaller baby. Placenta-mediated growth restriction refers to issues with the placenta, resulting in a lack of nutrients and oxygen getting to the baby, making a small baby. Multiple factors may be predisposing to this condition, such as maternal factors, including low pre-pregnancy weight, undernutrition, substance abuse, and severe anemia. Medical conditions can also affect the placenta, such as preeclampsia, autoimmune disease, thrombophilia, renal disease, diabetes, and essential hypertension. So we should be thinking about all of these possible causes when faced with a growth scan showing a small for gestational age baby. Now, in order to organize appropriate monitoring and observation of those mothers who are most at risk of having an SGA baby, we have identified some risk factors. These are very important as they can help to guide antenatal care. These include a previous SGA baby, maternal or paternal SGA, a previous stillbirth, advanced maternal age, an IVF pregnancy, a nulliparous woman, low BMI, smoking or cocaine use, and some medical conditions, including hypertension, diabetes, renal impairment, and antiphospholipid syndrome. Now, these risk factors are categorized further into minor and major risk factors according to the RCOG guidelines, and from there they are provided appropriate antenatal care. This can involve regular ultrasounds to monitor the growth of the baby and Doppler studies, essentially umbilical artery Doppler and uterine artery Doppler. Starting off with the umbilical artery Doppler. So this is performed after 26 weeks and is assessing the resistance to blood flow within the umbilical artery, which runs through the umbilical cord over here. So as we know, we have got two umbilical arteries, which are the link between mom and baby, providing the baby with the nutrients and oxygen it needs. Therefore, we do not want a high resistance to flow within the umbilical artery, as this is restricting the nutrients getting to the baby. The Doppler waveform looks something like this, with its characteristic sawtooth pattern when normal. The waveform is showing us alternating systole and diastole. The y-axis represents the velocity. 
So here the fastest velocity is known as the peak systolic velocity, PSV. And the slowest velocity is known as the end diastolic velocity, EDV. In a normal waveform, the EDV does not come down to zero, but rather allows for blood to flow through the umbilical arteries, even during a time of relaxation. This is normal, showing a normal resistance to flow through the umbilical cord and placenta. If the diastolic flow velocity starts decreasing, this is a sign of increased resistance to flow and placental insufficiency. So we've got some different examples here. So first we've got our normal waveform. As you can see, the end diastolic velocity does not reach zero. Now in this next one, we can see that the EDV is slower than the previous. So here we have decreased, but still positive diastolic flow. Next, we can see that the EDV has gone down to zero. Therefore, we have absent diastolic flow. Even worse, here we can see that the EDV is actually going below the line, and hence we have reversed diastolic flow here. This is a severe sign of placental insufficiency and will require a plan for urgent delivery. Sometimes, we also measure a uterine artery Doppler. The uterine arteries are the main blood supply of the uterus. Spiral arteries, which are small tributaries of the uterine arteries, support the growth of the placenta, which invades into the uterine muscle. Inadequate trophoblastic invasion of the spiral arteries results in a high resistance circulation and placental insufficiency. Therefore, a high uterine artery Doppler, specifically one with a pulsatility index above the 95th centile, is associated with placental insufficiency. This is performed at around 20 to 24 weeks in women who have risk factors predisposing to an SGA baby. Women with a high uterine artery Doppler will then be followed up with serial assessment of the umbilical artery Doppler. This video has given an overview on the definition, causes and risk factors associated with SGA babies. If you'd like to know more regarding how to diagnose and manage these cases, leave a comment with more on SGA below. Like and subscribe.